குட் ஈவினிங் எஸ் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் அனலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஏஸ் அகாடமி ஃபார் த டேட் சிக்ஸ்த் ஆஃப் ஜனவரி டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் தீஸ் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் வி வில் பி கோயிங் த்ரூ டுடே பிஃபோர் கெட்டிங் இன் டு த டிஸ்கஷன் ஐ ஹவ் அன் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் அனவுன்ஸ்மெண்ட் டு மேக் ஆர் யூ பேஷனேட் அபவுட் மாஸ்டரிங் ஜாகிரஃபி அஸ் அன் ஆப்ஷனல் சப்ஜெக்ட் ஹியர்ஸ் யுவர் சான்ஸ் டு எக்ஸல் கெட் ரெடி டு டீப்பர் இன் டு ஜாகிரஃபி வித் அவர் எஸ்டீம்டு ஃபேக்கல்டி மிஸ்டர் ஷபீர் ஏ பஷீர் whether you prefer offline sessions in chennai or online access from other branches this batch caters to your learning preferences prepare to enrich your understanding of geography with comprehensive teaching sessions designed to help you ace your exams mark your calendars for january 20th 2024 and join us for an enriching educational journey don't miss out on this opportunity to elevate your geography optional score for enrollment and further details visit our website with this happy announcement let's get into the news article discussion look at this news article according to this news article the election commission dismissed the concerns raised by the opposition leader regarding the electronic voting machine and the voter verifiable paper audit trail this is about the news here in this context let us quickly go through about electronic voting machine and the voter verifiable paper audit trail see the electronic voting machine is nothing but voting using electronic means it is noted that an evm is designed with two units the control unit and the balloting unit with the evm instead of issuing a ballot paper the polling officer will press the ballot button which enables the voter to cast their vote a list of candidates name and their symbols will appear and the voter has to press the blue button next to it know that the program used in the electronic voting machine cannot be reprogrammed in a particular manner furthermore the electronic voting machines are stand alone machines which are not accessible remotely from any other network so it eliminates the chances of getting tampered now let us see some facts about the voter verifiable paper audit trail the vvpat machines were first introduced in india in the 2014 lok sabha elections it is an independent system which is attached with the evms it allows voters to verify that their votes have been recorded accurately a printer is attached with the evm and it is kept in the voting compartment the printer prints a slip that contains the serial number the name of the candidate and the symbol of the candidate for whom the voter has casted the vote this printed slip remains exposed for 7 seconds under a transparent window and then cuts off automatically and falls into the drop box and this drop box remains sealed remember vvpat machines can be accessed only by the polling officer with this basics about the vvpat now let us see some pros and cons associated with the vvpat first the pros see the vvpat increases the transparency and eliminates the doubt about the accuracy of the evms secondly the paper trail generated by the vvpat can be used for post election audit and recounts this contributes to the overall integrity of the electoral process the last major positive is that it helps in building trust among the general public in the democratic process these are some of the positives associated with the vv pats now coming to the negatives the first con is that the process of printing verifying and storing paper receipts can slow down the voting process this leads to longer queues and increased waiting time at the polling station this is the first issue the second issue is that the vvpat is a dual system of electronic and paper based voting this adds complexity in the election process and potentially increases the chance of technical errors or glitches these are the two cons associated with vvpat system and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw few prelims related facts about evms and the vvpat system now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this article In this article the author talks about the steps to increase the faith in Indian democracy. In the analysis she spoke about the issues in the government and the opposition parties in India. She also spoke about the structural issues like anti defection law, role of media which is plaguing the Indian democracy. This is about the editorial in general. But in our discussion today we will focus on an main question related to Indian democracy. and we will try to use the points from the editorial in our answer okay now look at the question let me read out it recently a us based non profit freedom house downgraded india from a free democracy to a partly free democracy in this context 
write about the challenges facing Indian democracy and the steps that can be taken to address it. See, this question can be asked in GS paper too. Now, how to approach this question? See, this is a very simple question with a predefined structure. Firstly, it asks us to explain the challenges of Indian democracy and in the second part, it asks us to explain the steps that can be taken to address it. This should be the skeleton of your answer. Now, let's start answering. Let us start with the introduction. In the introduction, you can give a brief definition about democracy. See, democracy in simple words is a system of government where citizens can exercise their voices directly or through representatives as in the case of India. But this is like a blind man's description of an elephant. Democracy is more than that. In the words of Dr. Ambedkar, it is a form of social organization of the society. This means an egalitarian one with the basic ideals of freedom, dignity and equality. Know that without social democracy, a mere electoral democracy will be like an earth without oxygen. India has historical relationship with democracy. Democracy has been witnessed in Lachavi, Mahajanapata and through the Kudavoli system of the Chola period. Moreover, democracy is a light which can be held dear by our founding fathers throughout the freedom struggle. But recently, democracy in India is plagued by various issues which we are going to see in our answer. Okay. See, here I have given an elaborate definition of democracy. You can use the crux of the points that I mentioned in your introduction. Okay. Now, moving to the body of the answer. Here, we will first write about the challenges that the Indian democracy is facing right now. Okay. Firstly, the societal challenges to democracy. See, various social evils like poverty, illiteracy, casteism and patriarchy pose a serious threat to democracy. All these challenges pose a threat to democracy by breaking the feeling of brotherhood and fraternity. See, a man with an empty stomach will be more concerned about his lunch rather than the election. Recent issues of increasing communalistic feelings, hate crimes are adding fuel to the fire. This is the first issue or the first challenge that the Indian democracy faces. The second is with respect to political system. See, elections are an essential feature of the democracy. We are all aware of Lincoln's famous quote, democracy is the government of the people, by the people and for the people. But recently, this pillar of democracy is eroded by various factors. Now, let us see them one by one very briefly. See, during elections, there are various issues like casteism of politics, using money and muscle power, arousing communal feelings, etc. These are damaging the democratic fabric of our country. After the election, there are various issues like horse trading and defection of legislators for money. These are damaging the core of our democratic system. See, in a democratic country like India, the legislature is often called the temple of democracy. But here also, various issues like partiality of preceding officers, bypassing the scrutiny of parliamentary committee, Disruptions of proceedings by the opposition are posing a serious threat to the democracy. These are some of the challenges with respect to the political system that the Indian democracy faces. Moving on, the third major challenge is the economic challenge. Here the main culprit is the rising inequality in our society. Recent Oxfam report shows that the richest 1% of our country own more than 40% of India's total wealth. At the same time, the bottom half of the population together share just 3% of the wealth. This limits the life choices of the poor, thereby forcing them to stay in the bottom of the society. Moreover, other issues like corruption in the country, joblessness in the society, stagnating rural income, lack of social security of the workers are also affecting the Indian democracy in general. Okay, moving on, the next challenge is with respect to the role of the media. See, media is the fourth pillar of the democracy. It is playing an important role in questioning the government and creating a public opinion. In recent time, the challenges like paid news, hijack of media houses by the corporates, increasing surveillance of media is affecting the credential of the media in general. This is affecting the Indian democracy. See, these are some of the challenges that the Indian democracy witnesses. This addresses the first part of the question. In the second part, you have to write about the steps that can be taken to address these challenges. Here, firstly, you can mention that the government should be focusing on reducing the poverty. See, through the National Food Security Act, the government is trying to achieve food security. 
but the government should also focus on the other dimensions of poverty like hidden hunger this should be addressed steps like poshan abhiyan anemia mukt bharat are welcome steps by the government the steps like new india literacy policy will address the gap of adult literacy and make them empowered citizens this is the first step that the government can take to address the challenge faced by the indian democracy secondly the indian political system needs to be cleansed of criminalization this can be done by updating the representation of people's act 1951 also various recommendations of the sarkaria and the punchi commission can be followed to foster transparency in our electoral system steps like ensuring independence of speaker limiting the role of governor reforming the anti defection law to increase the individual freedom of the legislators should also be taken moreover the government should take steps to decrease the inequality in the society this can be done by progressively increasing the taxation also the issue of black money should also be addressed the government should also take steps to increase the participation of women in the workforce the steps like stand up india encouraging the participation of women in the fpos self help groups are also a welcome step fourthly the steps like using technology will reduce the corruption and increasingly empower the people for example use of direct benefit transfer and the jam trinity will increase the economic powers of the people the various subsidies like the basic minimum income for housewives directly in the bank account of women will empower them and make them a meaningful partner in our democracy finally the media and the civil society should be encouraged to actively participate in the society the various regulations in regularizing their fundings are a welcome step but it should not be used as a weapon to limit the voices of the opposition in the society these are some of the steps that can be taken to address the challenges faced by the indian democracy now we have addressed the body of the answer now coming to the conclusion part in the conclusion you can mention that despite all the challenges indian democracy is the largest and the vibrant one in the world the various issues of our present democracy should be addressed at the earliest to achieve a truly democratic inclusive nation we should also strive to make indian democracy as in the words of dr ambedkar as the one that should enhance the dignity of its citizen this could be your conclusion so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion through a mains question we saw some of the challenges faced by the indian democracy we also saw the steps that can be taken to address indian democracy now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this news article the article talks about the enrollment into the digi yatra without the consent of the passengers this is a major issue as digi yatra is promoted as a voluntary initiative this is about the news article given here so in this context in our discussion today let us see some prelims related facts about the digi yatra first of all digi yatra is an application that aids travelers to pass through various checkpoints at the airport in a hassle free manner this paperless and contactless method uses facial features to establish the identity of the passenger such an identity would be linked to the boarding pass this will allow the passengers to pass through the checkpoints in a hassle free manner now let us see who implements this program digi yatra project is implemented by the digi yatra foundation this foundation is set up as a joint venture company whose shareholders are the airport authority of india and the various airports of delhi bengaluru etc it is a industry led initiative which is implemented in coordination with the ministry of civil aviation now let us see how we can use this facility firstly a passenger has to register their details on the digi yatra app this can be done by using aadhar based validation and self captured image in the next step the boarding pass has to be scanned moreover we should share all the necessary credentials with the airport authorities now let us see the process in the airport see at the airport e gate the passenger has to first scan the barcoded boarding pass in this juncture the facial recognition system installed in the e gate will validate the passenger's identity and the travel documents once this process is done the passenger can enter the airport through the e gate after passing through the e gate the passenger will have to follow the normal procedure to clear the security before boarding the aircraft this is the process of using digi yatra an important feature of the digi yatra is that there is no central storage of personal identifiable information 
it means the ids of the passenger and the travel credentials are stored in a secure wallet on the passenger's smartphone itself in this way it ensures the privacy of the individual this is all about digi yatra moving forward let us see the benefits of using digi yatra system firstly it will facilitate paperless travel secondly it will provide a hassle free travel by avoiding identity check at multiple points thirdly we can enhance the security by using information of the passenger beforehand fourthly there will be collection of data about the real time passenger load of the airport so it will make the planning and allocation of resources in an efficient manner these are all some of the benefits of using the digi yatra system and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw various problems related facts about the digi yatra system now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this news article According to this news article the registration department has decided to move various registered documents to the blockchain system in order to secure them from being tampered this is also a step towards strengthening the cyberspace this is about the article given here in this context let us understand what is a blockchain and we will see how it is helpful in securing digital data first let us understand what is a blockchain technology see blockchain is a decentralized and secure digital ledger technology that operates on a network of computers and these network of computers are known as nodes let me explain how the blockchain works for example consider a digital art marketplace informations about each digital art transaction that happens in the digital art marketplace is grouped into a block depending on the block's content a unique cryptographic hash is generated for each block and these blocks are linked together in chronological order to form a continuous chain here hash is nothing but a function that converts the input of letters and numbers into an encrypted output of a fixed length remember each block will have a unique hash and each block also contains the hash of the previous block this way of connected and tamper resistant chain of blocks are created so if a new block is needed to be added to the chain then the consensus of the network of the participants is required once a block is added it becomes virtually impossible to alter this provides high level of security the chain of blocks together form a ledger and the entire ledger is distributed across all nodes this eliminates the need for central authority and ensures transparency now the thing is that if one wishes to change any information in a block then it would require changing the information in all subsequent blocks which is computationally infeasible this is the reason why blockchain system is very secured decentralized and impossible to be tampered with now let us look at the application of blockchain technology in administration see blockchain technology can be used in ensuring good governance it ensures transparency of public records through the usage of digital form platforms and allow auditing of the government documents it also allows to maintain the authenticity of the document and reduces the processing time this is about the application so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some basic points about blockchain technology now let us conclude this and take up the next news article look at this article the delhi high court has ruled that the entire process of transplanting organs from living donors should not exceed 6 to 8 weeks it also directed the health ministry to prescribe specific timelines for each stage of transplantation process in this context let us understand about the national organ and tissue transplant organization guidelines and the recent changes made to it see in india the transplantation of human organs act 1994 provides various regulations for the removal of human organs and their storage it also regulates the transplantation of human organs for therapeutic purposes and for the prevention of commercial dealings in human organs that is this act was enacted to prevent organ trafficking okay now what is the status of organ transplantation in india see india conducts the third highest number of transplants in the world organs from deceased donors account for nearly 17.8% of the total transplants in 2022 living donors constitute the majority accounting for 85% of the total donors in india donor numbers including both living and deceased have shown slow growth over the years recently the ministry of health and family welfare has earlier modified the national organ transplantation guidelines this change 
or this modification brought about change to the process of organ transplantation in India. Now let us see the recent changes made. Firstly, the age gap was removed. See, earlier according to the National Organ and Tissue Transplantation Organization guidelines, an end-stage organ failure patient above 65 years of age was prohibited from registering to receive the organ. But currently, the age, that is the upper age limit has been removed. This is mainly because the life expectancy of people in India has generally increased. This is the first change. The second change is the domicile requirement was also removed. See, the domicile requirement to register as an organ recipient in a particular state has been removed under the One Nation One policy. As per the recent guidelines, a needy patient can register to receive an organ in any state of his or her choice and will also be able to get the surgery done there. This is the second change. The third change is regarding the fees for registration. According to the recent change, there will be no registration fee that states were charging earlier for registration. See, earlier the states used to charge between rupees 5000 to 10,000 to register as a patient on organ recipient wait list. But currently, this has been removed. See, these three are the recent changes made to the guideline. So, that's all regarding this discussion. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Take a look at this news article. The news is that, according to the United Nations International Organization for Migration, nearly 76,000 people have been displaced in the past three months in Lebanon due to the ongoing war in Israel. In this context, let us revise about the geographical location of Lebanon in prelims perspective. See, Lebanon is an West Asian country located on the eastern shore of Mediterranean Sea. It is bordered by Syria to the north and east and by Israel to the south and by Mediterranean Sea to the west. Cyprus, which is an island country in the Mediterranean Sea, is very close to the Lebanon's coastline. Beirut is the capital of Lebanon and it is the second smallest country in Asia. Remember this fact, at the intersection of the Lebanese-Syrian boundary, particularly near the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, there is a small strip of land called the Sheba Farms. This area is a disputed region between Lebanon and Israel. Now, moving on, let us see the geographical features of Lebanon. Lebanon has four distinct physiographic regions. Firstly, a narrow coastal plain along the Mediterranean Sea, then the Lebanon mountains, thirdly, the Albica Valley, and finally, the Anti-Lebanon and the Hermon Ranges running parallel to the Lebanese mountains. In the east, the Albica Valley lies between the Lebanese mountains in the west and the Anti-Lebanese mountains. This region is filled with fertile soil. Because of this reason, Albica Valley is known as the Lebanon's most important farming region. The main rivers of Lebanon are River Litani, River Nur Ibram, River Nur Ibrahim and River Orontes. Finally, let us look at the climate of Lebanon. See, most of the Lebanon has the Mediterranean climate with warm dry summers and cool wet winters. The coastal plains mainly experience subtropical climate. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some of the basic prelims related facts about Lebanon. With this, we have come to the end of the news article discussion session. Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the practice prelims questions. We have three practice prelims questions today. Let us see them one by one. Look at the first question. This question is about the electronic voting machines. Here three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. They use reprogrammable microchips. This statement is incorrect. The microchip used in EVM is a one-time programmable microchip. It can neither be read or overwritten. Hence, the program used in the EVM cannot be reprogrammed in a particular manner. So, statement 1 is incorrect. Look at the second statement. An EVM being used by the ECI, that is the Election Commission of India, can record a maximum of 2000 votes. This statement is correct. Moving on to the third statement. The control unit can store the result in its memory for 10 years and even more. This statement is also correct. The control unit of the EVM can store the results in its memory for 10 years or more. Here, of the three statements, only two are correct. So, the correct answer here is option B, only two. Moving on to the second question. This is also a three statement question about the Digi Yatra. Three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. It is a joint venture project between the airport authority and some of the airports of India. This statement is correct. This we saw in the discussion itself. Moving on to the second statement. A person needs to be a frequent flyer to avail this benefit. 
this statement is incorrect because any passenger can use this benefit by downloading the digi yatra app in their phone okay so second statement is incorrect moving on to the third statement it is implemented at all the international airports of india this statement is incorrect because currently the digi yatra is implemented only in 13 airports of india so statement 3 is also incorrect since only one statement is correct here the correct answer is option a only one moving on to the last question which of the following statements is incorrect about the term levant first let me explain what is a levant levant is an approximate historical geographical area that is located in the eastern mediterranean region of western asia it is actually a land bridge between africa and eurasia it is basically a cultural and a historical region of greater syria which include present day syria lebanon jordan israel palestine and most of the southwest part of turkey okay this is a levant now let's come back here they are asking which of the following statement is incorrect about the term levant look at the first statement it refers to the entire coastal area of mediterranean sea this statement is incorrect because we saw that it is just the land bridge between the asia and the eurasian region okay so statement a is incorrect now with this we have come to the end of the discussion if you like this video like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankara as academy's youtube channel thank you for listening